When I bought my 130 year old house, there was no networking infrastructure to speak of, zero. I had to go back and retrofit the entire home with 10 gigabit ethernet. It's been a few years now and the performance is fantastic, but it was a lot of work and I'm someone who's fairly handy. If I weren't handy or if I were a renter, well, putting holes in my wall wouldn't be an option. If you rent or you're not handy, don't feel bad. Not all hope is lost. You too can achieve multi-gigabit wired performance in your home, your dorm, or your apartment without having to touch a single wall. At least not put a hole in one. Let's find out how. The most common recommendation you'll find on the web is Powerline. I don't like Powerline. Here's the thing. While the technology behind it is really cool, it's typically recommended because it's universally available to pretty much everyone. And that's because it uses your existing power outlets and the electrical lines in your walls, which if you're watching this video, you have. It's simple. You take a transmit node, wire it into your existing network, and then plug it into your wall. After which you take a receiving node and plug it in somewhere else. Get yourself a cheap patch cable, plug it into the device that needs an internet connection, and Bob's your uncle. Each transmit and receive node has its own logic on board that helps interpret the drastically different frequency signals sent over the same copper wires as your electricity. So that all sounds well and good. What's the problem with Powerline? Well, let me demonstrate. Because I just did a speed test with my home network connection using gigabit ethernet, and well, sure enough, I have gigabit speeds. If I unplug this ethernet cable that's going to a switch to my network and plug in this one that's going to my Powerline adapter, once we see the status is connected, which it is, I'll refresh the page, run it again, and, well, we're about to see the problem with Powerline, this. 40 megabits per second? <laughs> the performance of Powerline is hugely contingent on a number of factors. The age and quality of the copper wiring in your home. The physical distance in length, including all the cables, between your two nodes whether or not the nodes are on the same sub panel or even on the same breaker. And then, even if you get that figured out, anytime a compressor or blender motor or microwave kicks on, you're going to have vastly impacted speeds and in some instances, those devices will kick your connection off the network altogether. Not great. Even when all the stars are aligned, you're in an ideal situation, performance is still not great. I demo this to you from my gym, which is only two years old. We just built it. It has really high quality 12 gauge Romex, copper wiring, going to a bunch of different breakers on our garage sub panel. Over here, we have got a switch. This is connected back to our network in our main house, but it's on its own dedicated circuit. It is not electrically connected to this outlet, which has our transmitting node. There is an ethernet cable in between the two of them because it's got to have an internet connection to transmit. But the only other thing connected to this breaker, a 20 amp breaker, is another outlet that is directly wired in series. That one, where our receiving node is. They're only a few feet apart, they're directly connected, and so this is where we should get the best performance. Power line should peak out here, it should be fantastic. And well, if we hit go on speed test, it's uh, pretty good, it's fine. It's about 300-ish megabits per second, not bad. But again, we should be getting gigabit if we're at the same reliability and throughput as Ethernet. Additionally, this isn't even hitting what we can get on Wi-Fi 6. So this is a decent solution in an area where you don't have a noisy electrical circuit, but you also don't have the ability to do Wi-Fi. But we're not looking to get almost as good as Wi-Fi. We want to blow it out of the water. Just like today's sponsor, Sigma OS blows every other web browser out of the water. See, as native apps die and web apps thrive, the focus on the browser has increased, but the browser hasn't changed. It's just a window with tabs. And if you're really doing work in the browser, it gets so disorganized so quickly. Sigma OS feels like it's made for the modern day. And this begins with what they call workspaces. Workspaces are basically just sections of the browser that are organized by category. So I've got a finance section, I've got a social media section, I've got a networking section, which is what you've been seeing earlier in this video, and I've got a news section. From within uh, workspaces, there are a bunch of pages, pages that I can navigate up and down like regular tabs. 
They can be pinned, they can be customized, they can be tagged, and more. You can even isolate your workspaces from one another. So if you'd like to run multiple sessions simultaneously, you can. No more logging in and out of Google accounts, which is great. You might have noticed that this browser is beautiful. I mean, look at the UI changing based on the color of the web page that I'm navigating to. It's also lightning fast, and that's because it is based on WebKit rather than Chromium, like every other browser. So it's lightning fast, but you can still install Chrome extensions, which gives you the flexibility of Chrome, but the stability and speed of Safari. And then there's hotkeys. Hotkeys galore. If you can think it, you can probably do it. There's a focus mode, pressing F, that allows you to focus on the content that is in front of you. There is a split screen mode, so I can type in theverge.com, and it pops up here on the side. Goodbye. There is a command line, which I can use to enter, I don't know, new tweet. And check it out, a web page opens, ready to perform a new tweet. Q performs a quick search. So I can say, when was Bill Gates born? I can get my answer, and then as soon as I'm done, I push D for done, and I'm back exactly where I was right before. If I press H, I can snooze a web page and have it remind me at a date and time that I decide. A P opens up my password manager. And then there are a bunch of other really great features built into the browser from the get-go, like the ability to block ads. That is a default option. No more tracking here. Super great. Uh, one of the features that is my favorite is called Lazy Search. You just push the space bar and you basically type anything you want, anything you've got open. So even if your tabs are all specially organized, you're like, I know I have Chase open somewhere. You just type Chase and there it goes. It says it's already open in finance. I'm brought to the workspace. I'm, I've got the page open and it's fantastic. All of this syncs from Mac to Mac via the cloud. There are so many features that I have not even scraped the surface on for teams involving AI and more. Sigma is free for up to three workspaces, which is great. And for just $10 per month, you can get unlimited everything. I really think you should try it with the link below. It takes a little bit of work to learn, but once you do, I think you'll love it. Thanks to Sigma for sponsoring. So then what am I supposed to do? Drink mocha, baby. Mocha stands for multimedia over coax and uses, you guessed it, coaxial cable. While not true in every part of the world, if your home is in North America and older than 15 years or so, you've got coax in your walls. This is true of apartment buildings and dorms pretty much everywhere. Coax was utilized by TVs and cable boxes for decades. And so any place that would have had a TV probably has coax. This means bedrooms, common areas, sometimes even the bathroom and kitchen, etc. And Mocha is awesome because it uses all that old coaxial cable in your wall that's probably abandoned and sends ethernet over the top of it. If you are a boomer and you still use coax to power a cable box, who's still using one of those? The great news is Mocha doesn't get in the way because it operates on a different frequency. Just as we did with Powerline, we plug our transmitting node into our cable router. And any receiving node we plug into the wall with these coaxial patch cables. Now, if you do have any devices like, say, a cable box that do need to stay plugged in, Cable splitters are very inexpensive and work super well. You plug your input into the in and your outs to, well, your cable box and Mocha receiving node respectively. And once you do that, Bob's, well, Bob's not your uncle because unlike Powerline, coaxial Mocha does require a little bit of setup. We're going to take an ethernet cable, plug one end into our laptop, and plug the other end directly into the transmitting node, not into the network. And this is because we need to create a static IP on the subnet of the device so that we can access its local configuration portal. It's really pretty easy. Go into your network settings on your computer. Using DHCP, it will have already found an IP address, but this is bogus, it doesn't work, okay? We need to be on the same subnet as the device that we're intending to get access to. And we can see here in the manual that with this specific one, and it's different with every model, so check your manufacturer's instructions, the subnet is 192.168.254. something. So we're going to give our computer an IP address of 192.168.254, and they recommend 10. Okay, cool. We are now going to navigate to the device's web portal, which is located at 192.168.254.254. And if we do so, we're presented with a login page. So I am going to log in with the username admin and the password go coax, which for this device is the credentials. And here we are at the web portal. What can you do here and what should you do? 
Well, it depends on what your intent is. To avoid double NAT problems, which can happen if you have these things set up incorrectly, you should go into device settings and assign this device an IP address that's available on your home network. So you're gonna to need to find what your local IP address subnet is. Uh, mine is 10.0.0. something. And I'm going to define this uh, to a specific IP address on the range of my network. You can also do this from the router side, but I'm just going to do it here, giving it uh, an IP assignment of 142, okay? I will press save. And then what I can do after that, and this is also something I recommend, is going into your security settings. You can set a password for Mocha. Now, if you're in a regular standalone home, you can probably get away not doing this because ISPs put what they call a point of entry filter, a PoE filter that prevents outward coaxial access from neighbors or whomever. But if you're in an apartment complex or a dorm, somewhere where coax might be shared intra-network, you definitely wanna turn this on so that they can access devices on your network that is supposed to be yours. So. You can enter any alphanumeric password that you would like, and then dependent on the device, but pretty much for all Mocha 2.5 devices, you will enable DEXT security band. Um, once you do that, you press save, you reboot the device, and then you have to pair the devices by passing login credentials. It's really easy. You just push the button that's on each device. They call it MPS. It's just like WPS on your router. You push both buttons, they will pass the credentials across to one another, and then they are paired, but they are secure from other coaxial devices, other Mocha devices trying to get into your network. You are protected and safe. That's the setup you wanna do. Some special notes. Mocha is offered by default on many routers and modems that are provided by your ISP. So look at the back of the box you've already got. There may be a Mocha uh, transmitting node already built in. And if you have one, then sweet, save 60 bucks and just buy the receiving nodes. Secondly, Mocha is not only backwards compatible with previous Mocha standards, but it's intraoperable in between all Mocha node device uh, producers. So you can mix and match brands, which is not the case with Powerline really nice. Furthermore, each transmission does go to every node on the network. So throughput is reduced the more nodes you have. Keep this in mind as you're building out your network. It's better to have fewer nodes with ethernet switches than more nodes going to single devices at a time. Last, Mocha can be used as a backhaul for mesh networking systems. If you've got an Eero, one of these new fancy pants wireless routing systems that everyone's buying that has wireless repeaters, these wireless repeaters can always be wired manually via ethernet back to the main base station. They perform better because they're not retransmitting a wireless signal. They just transmit the wireless signal because they're wired directly into the main router. If you've got Mocha, you can use Mocha as an ethernet backhaul for these systems and it works fantastically. Your Wi-Fi will become way, way better. And those are the gotchas, but once it's set up, <laughs> It's incredible. On the left here, I have got the results of my gigabit ethernet that's in the wall. So it's about gigabit, what I pay for. And right here on the right, I'm going to perform a test with the Go Coax. Our coaxial is coming in from the wall, just like the ethernet. I've got power and there is an ethernet cable going to my laptop. That's the whole setup. All we have to do now is push go. Please be better than power line. <laughs> I mean, look at that. That is the same speed effectively as I am getting on ethernet. There is no difference. Now, I'm paying for gigabit ethernet. What happens if you have an even faster internet connection? Well, Mocha 2.5 supports up to two and a half gigabits of throughput, which is pretty crazy. Mocha 3, which is right around the corner, um, the silicon is not yet available, but the spec has been finalized, is capable of 10 gigabit. That should be out later this year which is pretty bananas. This is a no compromise solution. Sure, it's a little bit more expensive because you have to buy a node for every single place you wanna put an ethernet drop, but it is possible. Even our ping should be pretty similar. Okay, so we add a couple of milliseconds of latency, but it's much better than what we were getting with Powerline and the speeds are infinitely better. This is a great solution. It's not just fine, it's not just okay, it's legitimately good. If you don't have coax for Mocha, not all hope is lost. There is still a way to get ethernet around your home. And that's just by putting ethernet around your home. Hear me out, okay? You can do exposed runs, and this is not as ridiculous as it sounds. I'm not saying run cables across the middle of your floor. 
Using the termination guide on my previous video, you can save a bunch of money by just buying a box of like 500 feet of ethernet and wrap it around the perimeters of your room. It doesn't have to look janky. In rooms with carpet, you're almost always able to tuck it underneath the baseboards, making your cabling all but invisible. I like to use these automotive trim spudgers for the job. They work great and they allow you to maneuver the cable without damaging it. In rooms with tile or hardware flooring, you can use quarter round cable raceway. This is available cheap from your local hardware store. I would not recommend ordering it on Amazon. And you can use it to create discreet, frankly, even handsome looking track for ethernet runs. With outside elbows, inside elbows, cord ports, and more, the last thing anyone will think is that this is some janky fly-by-night ethernet installation. In fact, most people won't even notice because most homes, like mine, use cord around on purpose. It's really common to see. And you can make your ethernet hide in plain sight. These are just a few of the options to get wired networking around your home. If none of them seem feasible, don't give up on Wi-Fi because when deployed correctly, Wi-Fi can be really great. I've done a video on how to improve your Wi-Fi performance if yours is sucky. Follow this video up here. But other than that, thank you so much for watching. And as always, stay snazzy.